Good morning, Mobile County. I am Mrs. May, and I'm here to talk to you about light. We're looking at eighth grade physical science. A couple of things that we need to kind of review just so that we're all cut up and ready to move on to light energy is some things we talked about last week with sound and sound waves and the way that the waves behave in our environment. So I'm going to move on to reviewing sound energy so that we can talk about light. Remember, sound energy is a compressional wave. So I've got this back and forth motion of the vibration, okay, that goes through our, uh, goes through matter or a medium like solids, liquids, and gases. But that compressional wave needs that medium in order to pass through for sound. We're going to learn that that's not the case for light. We learned that some behavior about sound is pitch, ah, uh, uh, and loudness, like volume, loud, quiet. That has to do with the frequency and the amplitude of that compressional wave for sound. We learned that sound can be reflected like in an echo. We learned that sound can be refracted. In other words, it can change if it goes through a different medium, like air, to a solid, like if I were talking to you through a window, my sound would go through the air, through the glass, to your ear. We learned that sound can be diffracted. Uh, we talked about how we might spy or, or on somebody, listen to their conversation from around the corner because sound will go through that opening and diffract outward. And we talked about sound interference. We talked about how those waves can actually build on each other to make a louder sound. And that's called constructive interference. Or we talked about some cool technology that actually sends back a wave at the same wavelength, but timed a little bit different to actually cancel those waves out. And that's called destructive interference. And I wanna add something real quick. I'm gonna go off grid for a second. I learned this after our lesson the other day, and I'm not going to take it for face value yet. I'm actually going to confirm this for you from my friends at the Environmental Center off Gerby Road. If you ever get a chance afternoon to go out there and visit them, they're amazing people. But I want to contact them about this, and I hope you're listening to see if, see if you can help me out with this. I learned something about sound uh, before, um, after we met last, last week that owls actually have ears through all those little feathers that are actually one ear is pointed upward and one ear is actually pointed down. And so if you were to have somebody in the room with you, if you put two paper towel rolls on your ear, you can hear up sounds from above and sounds from below. And I'm not sure of the adaptation advantage of that for owls, but it's certainly true. If you put two tubes on your ears, you can hear up and down really clearly. So I'll get back to you about that on next episode, next Wednesday. All right, so that's wrapping up sound for us. Let's look at light energy. So light energy is uh, uh, does not require a medium in order to pass. So light energy can actually pass through empty space. It doesn't need air molecules, it doesn't need a solid, and it doesn't need a liquid in order to pass. It can pass through empty space. And depending on the amount of energy we are talking about with this radiation or light energy, um, sometimes this uh, light energy can go through even a solid. So if we're looking at what's called the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. This is the way that we organize those light waves, that light energy, uh, for us to be able to um, understand how the energy can um, be changed between types of radiation. So what we're going to do is kind of look back at the wave properties that we talked about a few episodes ago, where we have a crust and a trough we have the wave length, if you recall, that's the distance between a crest and a crest or a trough to trough. And we also have amplitude. And that is from the, that's the measurement from the resting place to the part that the wave is actually displaced. So if we're looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, we can see very easily that we are talking about a special kind of transverse wave, okay, not compressional like sound, we're talking about a transverse wave. We'll talk more about that in just a second. And that the different types of radiation or light energy is actually organized by wavelength. So 
We're going to talk about speed in a minute too. All of our light travels at the same speed. We can change the amplitude and we can change the wavelength of our radiation. So at the lower end of the spectrum, we're looking at some a wave that's really long. We have a long wavelength or a low frequency. And that's looking at things like radio waves that travel very far. We can look as we go up to, through the spectrum, we get more and more energy, we get more frequency, shorter wavelengths, and we get to things like microwaves and infrared radiation. We get to our visible light, which I've got a lot of uh, activities or demonstrations to show you in a second. We get to ultraviolet light, x-rays, which some of us may be familiar with, and then high energy gamma rays. Only a small portion of this spectrum is actually invisible light. When I say that, that's because our detectors are specialized just for visible light. Now, there are some organisms on Earth that can actually detect other types of radiation. If you want to um, think about a snake, for example, that senses heat of its prey, they're utilizing that infrared part of that spectrum. All right. So let's talk about light itself. Light is not like sound. Light is not caused by a vibration. Light is actually caused by that electron in the atom changing energy levels and that energy is emitted. We call that emission or that energy a photon. Now the behavior of that photon can act as a particle and as a wave. We're gonna focus on the wave aspect of light energy. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting experiments through history that uh, you can uh, research that will talk to you about how this came to be, that we know that light acts as a particle and a wave. Really interesting. I hope your science teacher in high school covers that really well for you. It's very cool. Light rays, light rays also emit from the source in a direct line, and that is a really important behavior because we can manipulate that in a lot of technology and a lot of um, things that we do in our daily life, like take pictures, for example. I'm going to give you a little history lesson at the very end. All right. I like visuals, so this is a visual for us. So this is the top wave is our mechanical wave. If you'll recall, that is our wave that needs a medium in order to pass. And this is what we've already talked about before, our transverse wave, a mechanical wave. And you have that up and down motion. So the particles will actually go perpendicular to the direction of the wave. The bottom uh, example is actually what we're looking at when we're talking about radiation or light energy. So if you look, we actually have two transverse waves. And those waves are what they call oscillating. So that's that motion that you see perpendicular to each other. And that is made up of an electric wave and a magnetic wave. And that's why we call it electromagnetic energy. But that's what it looks like in motion. All right, how do we measure light? We measure light by the lumen. We look at how much light is put out and how we measure is how bright it is. So that's the lumen. But I bet you've heard lux before. And lux is just looking at the lumens that are put out by the light in a specific area. Uh, something I learned new before I taught physical science, I thought watt was the actual like brightness of the light bulbs that you go and you look at and you read the label and you're trying to get a good wattage for your light bulb. When in fact, the watt is actually the power that it takes to make that brightness. So even I learned new stuff too. All right, let's get to talking about wave behavior. So we've talked about the properties of light. Now let's talk about how wave behaves. And I think you'll actually think that waves of sound and waves of light have the same behavior. And you're right. Reflection of light. So we know that we can look in a mirror and we can see our reflection. But what does that actually mean as far as light behavior goes? Well, that means we've got what's called an incident ray. So the initial ray of light energy coming in, bouncing off the mirror and back to our eyes. And so we can, I think we can all imagine looking in a mirror and how clear that picture is for us, for our detectors to see how that nice sharp light reflection comes back in a very nice crisp sharp picture for us. But not all surfaces are the same. For example, I have a piece of aluminum foil here. 
and we can tell that it's shiny, right? It has some luster to it. But I'm not going to get a very clear reflection from a surface like this. And if we looked at this really closely with our magnifying glass, we might see that the surface is actually really rough. So where we have some light reflection um, on most surfaces, not all surfaces are created the same. Smooth surfaces usually reflect light a lot clearer than rougher surfaces. All right, I want to expand on that um, idea of light behavior. So here we have our reflected ray, so that's what we just talked about, the light that is bouncing back. But I also want to talk about absorption. Absorb when And sound energy does this also, uh, especially if you're trying to create a nice home theater. You don't want sound bouncing off the walls and windows. You're going to put some things like curtains and rugs and couches in there to absorb some of the sound energy so that it doesn't echo. Well, light is the same way. So we can utilize this absorption quality of light um, many ways. One of the ones that we uh, utilize light absorption is called polarization. And if you think about your good, high quality polarized glasses, they utilize this technology. So what I have right here is just two pieces of film. It's called polarized film. And if I were to look at this really closely, I would see that this polarized film is actually little slits of, um, of darkness. And if I take these polarized pieces of paper, you can see how I, my eye is going to see how some of that area becomes dark. What that's doing, what that polarization is doing, is actually forcing that electromagnetic wave. So let's think back a second. That's that, those two oscillating transverse waves that are perpendicular to each other and forcing them through those slits. So the part that is not uh, going through or transmitting through is actually getting absorbed by some of those uh, thicker pieces of the film. So this is, uh, I hope you can see this. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I hope I'm going to put it on the white background here. So this is a piece of polarized film. And I've actually taken another piece of polarized film and I have cut it up into like a disc. And I'm going to turn that disc and hopefully you can kind of see how the darkness changes, the little segments of darkness changes as I rotate it. And that's just forcing those light waves between those slits. Some are getting absorbed, some are getting transmitted through. But I can do one better. Um, you can actually take that polarized film and create a kaleidoscope. So it was too hard for us to zoom in on the kaleidoscope, so I actually filmed this at home for you. So I'm going to play a little video for you. All right, so now I have my two cups and they're actually covering each other, nesting together. And you can see that the radiation coming through is having to pass through both of those polarized pieces of film, forcing those waves into a certain pattern. And because I'm changing the light wave, I'm actually able to visualize different colors like in a kaleidoscope. All right, so here they are. So I have my two cups, I nested them together, put them at a light source, and 
I get to see some really neat different colors like a kaleidoscope. You can order that offline anywhere. All right. One of the things that we really appreciate is that we're able to see color. And what is it that we are actually seeing when we see color? We are actually seeing that reflected light wave back to our eyes. And this is a great, I love this uh, diagram because it shows that we've got white light. So every light you see coming from the sun, coming from light bulbs, are white light, meaning that they're made up of all colors. Now, if we're seeing the color black, that means that all those waves are getting absorbed um, by that material. If we are seeing white, therefore all the colors are reflected back to my eye. And you can see that each time we see a color, that's actually because that light wave is actually getting sent to our eyes at that frequency. I think that's really cool. We can actually demonstrate that and your elementary teacher might have taught you how you can mix colors. So if I have different colors here, and you know it's really fun to mix things. I've got blue and red, make purple, or I can have yellow and blue, make green. So y'all know how that works. That's a lot of fun too. All right, our second type of wave behavior is refraction. And if you've been to the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, they have a bunch of beautiful tanks out there that you can see fish. And if you stand at a certain corner of the tank, it kind of looks like the fish is in a couple different places. That's because light is refracted. When, just like sound, when sound enters a different medium, the light wave is actually bent and it comes back to our eye uh, showing it that the object is actually in a different place. Talking about speed of light, the speed of light is about 670, mile, 600, 670 million miles per hour, okay, as it and it changes as it goes through different mediums. So when you're spearfishing, for example, you're not going to aim at the fish that you actually see because you're going to take in consideration refraction. You're actually going to aim a little bit closer to you. Same thing when you're looking at fish in a tank. As you move from side to side through that tank, looking through the glass, the light has to go through the water to the fish, back through the water, back through the glass to your eye. You know that fish doesn't exactly look like it's in the same place that it is. All right, something really cool, I call this the zebra cup. So this is a, a neat way to look at refraction. So here I've got the medium of air, and I've got water, and now I'm going to take my stripes. And if you look at the paper by itself, the stripes are going in this direction. But if I put the stripes behind the water, the light is actually refracted when it comes back to your eye. And you'll notice that the lines appear like they're going in the opposite direction. So that's kind of fun, like an optical illusion. All right, another optical illusion is the Benman's disc. And I have um, done this, if you're looking at it, uh, you could print it out at home. You could put it on a push pen if you want to spin it that way. I modified my, my beach fan in order to uh, make this work. But as the fan spins at a certain speed, all those black lines will actually come across to you as the different colors of the rainbow. So I would, would encourage you to go print one offline and actually check that out. It's really neat. You can actually see it a little better when it goes slower. All right, so that is continuing our wave behavior. Diffraction. So just like sound can diffract, light can diffract. So even though you have a closed door in a dark hallway, you know the light is on because you will see the light emitting from underneath the door, the door opening at the bottom. And so light behaves very much the same way as sound does. It, it can go through an opening and diffract and bend out through that opening. And the fourth wave behavior, interference. Uh, one of the key experiments to determine that light behaves as a wave and a particle was done through what's called the double slit experiment. And so we have a light source, the light energy, because it travels in a straight line, emits through two little slits. And when you project that onto um, a screen or, or a surface on the other side, you can see where we have constructive and destructive interference by looking at light and dark bands of light. 
All right, so I'm gonna sum up light for you and then I wanna show you something really cool that um, we get at our house called a Tinker Crate from KiwiCo. It's a, it's a company that sends little science kits and I'm a science teacher and these things are awesome. All right, so looking at light, it's an electromagnetic wave of energy. The brightness is measured by the amplitude of the two oscillating waves. Important aspect about light, it travels in a straight path. It can be reflected, it can be absorbed, it can be refracted, and it can be diffracted. And of course, we can have interference of both kinds, constructive and destructive. All right, so here's kind of a history lesson um, so this, this, will, this is for my history buffs, but it's also for my art buffs, that there is a really neat, simple piece of um, history that has built many, many, many high technology things like cameras and movie projectors and uh, really cool stuff called the camera obscura. So if you've ever heard of a pinhole camera, the camera obscura works in very similar ways. So because we can manipulate the way the light goes into an aperture or a hole, like a pinhole, we can use things like mirrors for reflection. We can use a transparent or translucent piece of material like a, like a screen to project on. There's a lot of really neat things that came from the history of the camera obscura. So if you're like me, I'm always looking for fun stuff to do, and these KiwiCo Tinker Crates are, are it. They're awesome. But one of the things that uh, my kids and I constructed was one of these camera obscuras. So it will teach you about lenses, okay? It will teach you about how lens gets extended or retracted in order to focus. And one of the things I did was take this outside. Um, again, I have a quick video for you and um, I'll be glad to narrate it for you again. Um, that talks about how people used to use this type of technology to go out into nature and uh, they were able to document and draw the nature that they saw for books and publications um, because you think they didn't have the technology like we have today and how they were used by artists to project large paintings which they could sketch and trace and then later paint. So I took my camera obscura outside and I made a quick video for you. So if you take, the, take it outside, right now it's out of focus and I have put a sign um, in front of it and I'm going to pull the focus out to get, make it a little bit focused. I'm, I'm using the reflection of the light waves in order to do this. Let's see if you can read what it says. All right, it says boo. And what do you notice about that image? That image is actually upside down and backwards. And that is because the light waves that are coming in are getting reflected off of the mirror inside my camera obscura and coming to my eyes um, in a different orientation. Now, newer cameras and newer projectors can actually have another setup with a, a couple other mirrors in there and actually turn the image right side up like we like to see. So I encourage you to, you know, print off your Benman's disc. See if you can see multiple colors through black as it spins. Um, play around with some refraction. Okay. Notice that different surfaces can reflect, but not as clearly. And I certainly encourage you to uh, keep experimenting uh, with things that science kits, many of them are online, but the Tinker Crate from KiwiCo is certainly one of my favorites. All right, uh, this has been eighth grade physical science for this week. I'm Mrs. May. Thank you for having me today, and I hope to see you next week for our last episode, Wednesday at 1030.